Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and today I want to talk about a little piece of tabletop history, a book wrapped in as much myth and legend as the contents it contained, and that is TSR's Deities and Demigods, the first printing. Published in 1980 for first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, the book was 144 pages, and among the rules and tips for running gods and religions contained 17 pantheons to use some ancient mythologies, some fantasy, a few real religions which are still practiced to this day, which there's a whole different video topic altogether. It also has great information on how to use gods and omens and divine ascensions, as well as holidays and priestly vestments for the different religions and how the cleric should dress. This was a great book. But the thing that this book is most known for, and where the scandal and legends arise, is due to this book. This is the third printing of Deities and Demigods, uh, very, very similar, almost identical. However, this book is 128 pages and only has 15 pantheons instead of the 17 that this one contains. Oddly enough, though, the third printing still says 17 pantheons on the back. The two missing pantheons are the Cthulhu mythos from the writings of H.P. Lovecraft and the Melnibonian mythos from the writings of Michael Moorcock in his Elric series. The removal of these two sections caused quite a stir with D&D fans, and wild stories and speculations and rumors began spreading throughout different conventions and game shops all across the world. Stories of lawsuits and copyright claims, attacks from parent groups and the opening stages of the satanic panic, which led to copies being branded illegal, or in some colorful renditions of the tale, they were destroyed by court order making these original copies even more rare and more valuable. And usually the better story you hear about it means they're trying to up the price and selling you one of these. And since every good story needs a good villain, there were several villains to choose from. The game company Chaosium was frequently cast in that role, having owned the copyrights to both of those now missing pantheons. Other versions cast TSR in that role, specifically author James M. Ward as the villain, for attempting to steal intellectual property. However, 40 years later, many of these rumors still lurk around, uh, whether that be comments that I've received in some of my videos, or even one really interesting encounter that I had uh, in the opening month of this year where I met with an older gamer at a convention, and he explained to me with sage-like authority how Chaosium, the wicked Chaosium, forced TSR to burn all of the old editions, and that's why, even 40 years later, we should boycott Chaosium. Seriously, that was a really weird conversation. But the whole reason I did this video was because I met with that guy, so it wasn't all bad. And he delivered his story with the proper passion and drama of a preacher who's delivered the same sermon a hundred times. And any time I tried to interject with a, well, you know, that's not quite how I heard that story. You know, he would shush me the way Yoda might shush an ignorant Padawan. James M. Ward still has to defend himself from persistent accusations of plagiarism, or that he didn't properly secure the rights to the Lovecraft and Moorcock material, and I have no doubt that he did as he claimed. Moorcock has even admitted in later interviews that he granted permission to both companies. So both companies had legitimate cases, but court fees cost a lot of money, and neither company had a lot of money for court fees, so a compromise was struck between them. Over the last few years, several blogs and YouTubers and websites have shed some light onto the legend, kind of disproving some of the many rumors about it, but they usually leave parts out of the story or they continue to spread some of their own false information. Now one website, DM David, has a great blog about this, and it is clearly well researched. I've stuck a link below because I highly recommend reading it to anyone wanting some more information about this story, and kind of a snapshot of what the industry was like in those early Wild West days. However, instead of me making a video where I say, hey everybody, all those stories you heard about deities and demigods from eight-hand sources or internet personalities are completely wrong, because I, an internet personality, have my own eight-hand sources that must be the true story. I figured I could do a bit better than that, so I've asked Sandy Peterson to give you an account of his story directly to you. Sandy? Thanks, Seth. From late 1980 till 1988, I was working for Chaosium Incorporated. Now, I wasn't the top guy at the company, but how far down can you be when there's only six of you, right? 
Anyway, the information I'm going to give you is technically secondhand, but it's from people that were only one step removed from me and people that I know and trust and were my friends. In 1980, TSR came out with Deities and Demigods, first edition. Now, in this book, helpfully for D&D players, it had the stats for Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos. It had stats for Elric of Melnibonet's Mythos from uh, Michael Moorcock, and it had Fritz Leiber's Noan Universe with Fawford and the Grey Mouser. This was nice. There was an issue with it, though, because when we saw copies of this at Chaosium, which, I, of course, I went on and bought my own, uh, we noticed that, we knew that we had got the license for Lovecraft's material from Arkham House directly, and we had gotten the license for Michael Moorcock's Elric books from Michael Moorcock, and we had the license for Fritz Leiber's Fawford and the Grey Mouser. We had all three of these belong to us. So we contacted TSR. Now, a little background story here. This was during the dark days at TSR, when the Bloom brothers had basically had a hostile takeover of TSR. They had kicked Gary Gygax out to Hollywood to do TSR Entertainment, where G Greg, uh, Gary lost his wife and one of his kids to the Hollywood things, and he was out of the picture. So it was just the Blooms doing things in all their dark, sinister evil. So Greg calls them and says, we have the license to do these three products, and uh, you don't have the license, and we think it's good that TSR players and D&D players are able to play these games. That's a fine thing. We don't demand any money from you. All we want is for on the title page in small letters somewhere down at the bottom, you say, special thanks to Chaosium Incorporated for the use of these specific licenses. That's all we asked for. And the Bloom said, hmm, oh, okay. And so then we waited to see what would happen. Well, in the second edition, it came out and Lo and behold, on the title page, there was the thanks. Special thanks to Chaosium for these licenses. But in the text, in the book, those three uh, pantheons had been removed. I, so they gave us the credit, but they didn't put in the pantheons, which seems crazy to me, because why give us the credit without the pantheons? I don't see how this helps D&D players at all to not have the pantheons. It's just a worse book, right? And then later on, the third edition came out, and in the third edition, there was also not the thanks anymore. So I don't know what the Blooms were thinking. Um, I'm glad I don't understand how their brains work, but this seemed like a dumb fiasco to me. And it's kind of connected to another fiasco, which gives you a little insight into the Blooms, maybe, which is uh, later on, now, as, as I mentioned, we had the first library uh, license to do games on Fawford and the Grey Mouser. And you may have noticed that Chaosium never did a game based on this, which we were planning to do. Here's why. We got an announcement, an official press release from TSR, that they were going to do a Fritz Leiber material. So, uh, we had like a signed contract. We called up the Blooms, Greg did, and said, we have a signed contract. We w and we did it the right way. We went to Fritz Leiber's agent, he signed it, we had the contract, it was rock solid. He said, we have the right to do Fritz Leiber's universe, and you do not. And they said, oh, yes we do. We said, how do you have it? And it turned out that the Blooms had cornered Fritz Leiber at a bar at some convention. And at this time, I'm not sure Fritz Leiber was an alcoholic, but he was drinking kind of heavy. And they caught him at a weak moment, and they said, we want to do it, and we're the biggest company, and let's do Fritz Leiber. And he said, oh yeah, sure, so he signed the paper. So they had a signed document with Fritz Leiber, and we had one from the agent that predated it. So ours technically still was the correct one. So, you know, Greg points this out, Greg Stafford says, we have the license. And the Blooms then said, oh yeah, you're in good shape now. And they said, I am? He said, yeah, because, because First Light were signed this other thing. You can now, like, get big damages from Fritz. You can sue him, you can get all this money, you can get all, all this stuff out of First Light because he foolishly um, signed this other document. And we'll go ahead and publish ours anyway because we don't care about you. And Greg hung up the phone and he turned to me and he said, uh, Fritz Leiber's one of my heroes. I love his books. I don't want to take advantage of him and, and, and get money out of him for doing this. I mean, I was trying to do the license to give him money. So we just called the Blooms back, or Greg did, and said, you get the license, we will give up ours voluntarily. And uh, that is why we never came out with Fawford and the Grey Mouser, because Greg Stafford wanted to be the good guy and not hurt Fritz Leiber. And there you have it. Okay, so there you go. And Sandy's story lines up with DM Daniel's blog as well. Again, I highly recommend reading that for anybody that'd like more information on the legend. 
In 1981, Chaosium went on to publish the Stormbringer RPG, as well as Call of Cthulhu with Sandy at the helm of that project. They also released Thieves' World that year, which included information from various RPG games, including AD&D, which TSR had given them permission to use. According to Shannon Applecline and Designers and Dragons, TSR granted this permission to Chaosium in return for permission for them to use the Lovecraft and Moorcock in the Deities and Demigods. That was the deal that was struck between them. TSR did credit Chaosium in the second printing of Deities and Demigods, which still included the Elric and Cthulhu information, but then they removed the Pantheons once they got around to the third printing, while still thanking Chaosium for permission to use them. By the fourth printing, they had removed both of the two pantheons and no longer thanked Chaosium for their use, and they also got around to updating the back cover to say 15 instead of 17, so better late than never. Had TSR just left the two pantheons in it and added the credit to Chaosium, just like they did for the second printed, and then just left it alone after that, no one would have really noticed the difference or the change, and the legends and the rumors would have never happened. And I don't believe the story that those two pantheons were removed as a response to the satanic panic. After all, they didn't touch any of the other pantheons in the book, and Cthulhu and Elric are hardly the only ones that featured evil gods, so why those two specifically? So I'm personally of the camp that believes that the removal the removal of those two pantheons was because TSR didn't want to publish stuff that might point their customers to rival games out there. Like, somebody might read the Cthulhu or Elric and be all like, man, I'd love a game that's all about this, and oh, hey, somebody's got a game all about this, I'll buy their stuff instead of D&D. So I believe it was a business move to keep people into D&D and not send them off to other companies. DSR released their Linkmar City of Adventure campaign setting in 1985, set in Fritz Leiber's Naewon, and featuring that beautiful Keith Parkinson cover, one of my very favorite of Parkinson's paintings. On a personal note, Lankmar's City of Adventure was extremely influential on me, and not just because of that Parkinson cover. Uh, this book turned me into a huge fan of sword and sorcery thieves and thieving adventures, and without it turning me on to that, I would never have written The Mist of Lishtofen, my very first short story sale, which I later read for a podcast, and you can listen to a recording of that on one of my YouTube videos. That then led to my Black Raven series, which thankfully R.C. Bray read the audiobook versions for those because I'm not a good narrator. Call of Cthulhu went on to becoming my favorite tabletop role-playing game. In fact, just this year, my debut published scenario, A Mother's Love, was released for Call of Cthulhu in the new tales from the Miskatonic Valley, which just won the Gold Innie Award, by the way. I should probably do a video on that subject, about my scenario and the Any Award and all of that, and I will make a video on that, but today is not that day. The Old Deities and Demigods has become a bit of a collector's item, a mythos tome itself containing rare and forbidden knowledge. Well, rare in the fact that it was about 15,000 copies that went out in distribution, and none of the information inside was actually forbidden, but it does make for a great story, doesn't it? On eBay, they'll go for about 200 bucks, but if you scour conventions and used bookstores, you can probably find ones for a lot cheaper. This one I picked up at a used bookstore for $4 back in 2000 or 2001, so pretty good investment. And because these books look nearly identical, and neither of them say first printing and third printing or anything like that, there are different resources, like this one, that can help identify which printing it is that you have to know whether it's a first, second, third, or fourth printing. It's a neat little piece of tabletop history, and the legends, whether they be the true legends or the not-so-true ones, make it a much more exciting story. I'd like to give a huge thank you to Sandy Peterson for giving us this strolled on Memory Lane. Now, he has released his own guide to the Cthulhu Mythos for both 5th edition D&D and Pathfinder. So for all of you out there that are playing those games, you might want to pick that up if you want some Cthulhu the Sandy Peterson way. He also has his own YouTube channel where he talks about various things such as game design or other stories about tabletop and computer gaming industries from back in the day. Remember, this guy helped design Doom and Quake and the Age of Empire series, and he has got a lot of great stories. I especially like the Dark Days of Chaosium, uh, the one where he tells the stories of goats that they used to keep in Chaosium's basement, and I'm not telling you why, you have to watch the video, so definitely check his channel out. 
Anyway, that is it. Bit of a change of pace for my usual videos. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of my stuff, whether they be game reviews or how-tos or hopefully some more kind of, you know, histories of the gaming industry, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, gamers, you have a great day.